I guess the question is when should an animal be brought into the clinic? Um, I wouldn't really advocate anybody does any kind of surgical procedure at home, <laughs> yeah. really, you know, and, and, and you see some videos on YouTube and you just think, oh yes. my goodness. Yeah. I think there are good things and bad things about morphs is how I would summarize it. I mean, mm -hmm. the other good thing about morphs is it's leading to the domestication of certain species. Welcome to episode number 79 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you are looking for more information on the podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring the episode of the podcast. As always, there are affiliate links in both the YouTube description as well as the show notes at animalsathomenetwork.com. And thank you so much for everyone who's actually gone through the affiliate links and made a purchase that does really help support myself and it helps me produce the show. And if you'd like to show your support in another way, the best thing you can do is share the content. If you enjoy this episode, you found it valuable, share it with the other reptile people, the other reptile folks within the community. The more people we can get listening to the show, the larger the community grows and the more we're going to be able to do. So any sharing is always greatly appreciated. So today I'm speaking with an exotic vet out of the UK, Dr. Tarek Abu Zar. I have referenced him before. You may remember in the snake enclosure size video I did, I actually referenced him at the very beginning of that video. And I believe he's definitely been brought up a couple of times on the podcast. And if you are part of the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry group on Facebook, you definitely have seen his name floating around. So Tarek is an incredible resource because not only is he an exotic vet, he's also a long time reptile keeper. So this gives him a very unique perspective when it comes to not only the hobby, but also how that marries with veterinary medicine and how we can continue to advance care and husbandry forward. In this episode, we discuss how Tarek got into veterinary medicine. We discuss what it's like to operate on those tiny little creatures that you have to operate on once in a while. We discuss how and when to implement veterinary care for your animals. When should you bring your animals in for a checkup? At what point in, during an illness should an animal be brought into a clinic? We discuss at-home procedures that are okay to do and which ones are definitely not okay to do. And of course, we discuss some husbandry things as well. Tarek's collection, what he breeds. We discuss snake enclosure size as well as morph. So we do cover a lot of ground here. I do really hope you enjoy this conversation. Without anything further, here is my conversation with Dr. Tarek Abu Zar. Enjoy. Well, Tarek, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much for having me. I love this show. I'm excited to be on it. Good, good. Yeah, you are one of those <laughs> guests that com constantly comes up as a, a request. So I'm happy to do that. And it's always nice to have a vet on so we can chat. It's a little more medical details and things that we don't often talk about on the show. So, but before we do, can, can you, what came first? Was it your interest in veterinary medicine or was it reptile keeping? Because sometimes people get into reptile keeping afterwards once they get into the medicine. So I'm curious what your story yeah. is. I think I'm quite unusual amongst vets because I think what you've just said is right most of the time. I think most vets start off as vets and then they kind of get into exotics from there. But I didn't. I went about it completely the other way around. I was a keeper first for many, many years before I decided to go to vet school. And I actually think that keeping these animals is one of the reasons I am a vet. You know, that sort of inspired my interest. It made me understand the husbandry and some of the problems that people can face. And, you know, I was interested in science and I had that firsthand experience. So I decided to put two and two together, I guess. Yeah. And th that's a really good story to share because it's, for me, it's one of the positives of the hobby. And I love to highlight things that I do consider as like a staple of the hobby. And that is one of them is introducing people to animals. And, uh, for sure. and then it for sends sure. you down this awesome path. So how did you initially get into keeping then? Well, I, I'm, I'm interested in both birds and reptiles and I actually started off keeping birds. So, um, when I was seven, for some reason, I don't know why it was just an idea that I got in my head. Maybe I'd been to a pet store or something and seen some budgies in an aviary. Um, but I just really, really wanted some. So I nagged and nagged and nagged my parents. And eventually on Christmas morning, when I was seven, I had a pair of budgerigars. And from there, I kept all sorts of other different birds, cockatiels, conyers, parakeets. And a lot of the shops that were selling bird things would also have like a reptile section. Mm -hmm. And I started to see corn snakes and, you know, and, and I started to look at the equipment that was on offer and the cages. And I thought that would be really cool to, to try and keep one of those. So I kind of made that progression then from birds to reptiles. I mean, ultimately birds and reptiles are all reptiles. 
That's, yeah. that's a really interesting subject um, in terms of the taxonomy of it all, because they're all basically the same thing. Um, but yeah, so, so I started with birds and then I progressed into reptiles. And then for my whole teenage years, I mean, that's what I was doing. Other people were playing on Playstations and things, and I was doing all sorts of crazy things, keeping animals. And then, um, yeah, and then I decided to apply to vet school and the rest is history. And what you say is so true. I There is no doubt I wouldn't be a vet being an animal keeper. You know, so, so keeping has made me into a vet and I've been able to use that skill to help lots of animals, including many wild animals, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure for a lot of zookeepers and people involved in conservation and that sort of thing, you know, I'm, I'm sure it triggers an interest that allows them then to do more for society. Yeah, I think an yeah. experience with captive animals, regardless if it's in a private collection or a zoo collection, is definitely a lot, the spark for many kids especially. And yeah. the funny thing about being a vet is it's a goal for many animal lovers as kids, but then as you get old, you you realize it's actually not at all what I want to do because you realize the nitty gritty of it and you know it's not just working with animals. So I'm you obviously probably went through that experience as well, but you still wanted to do it. So what what made you want to become a vet? Well, I, being a, I mean, it's very difficult to become a vet in terms of actually getting a place. I was fortunate in that I did quite well in my science exams in school. So I had the grades to be able to do it. And I, I like, I like dealing with people as well. I mean, that's one of the things that you have to be good at mm -hmm. as a vet. And actually it, it's more of a case of dealing with animal owners often than it is with dealing with animals and not just from the point of view of helping them with their animals but often you're you're helping them in a way or in, in many many of my consultations i feel like i'm more of a shrink or something you know yeah, yeah. Or people just come to see you to have a chat and um so i i think i i like working with people and i love obviously working with animals and i also find science and medicine and drugs and anesthesia and bacteria and all of that medical side of things really fascinating it just seemed like the job that marries up all those things nicely and the natural progression i have no regrets about doing it i love what i do um and i i think i'm very lucky to have the job that i do actually yeah no that's fantastic and i think many people only think of the animal side they don't think of the human side of having to deal with people and dealing with people who are upset and you know people who are you know having to pay bills and things and they just then you get to the point where you're like you know what a vet is not for me so it takes yeah. a very special type of person to want to pursue it and then be good at it and you're right i mean sometimes it can be really sad mm -hmm. you know some and it's a very emotionally draining job and that's one of the reasons why the suicide rate is so high among vets you know and yeah. and also you know finances is a, is a really difficult one to have to to deal with you know it's, it's there are all sorts of downsides to being a vet as well but i think overall it's it's a really interesting job and and i think you know you you do get to make a difference to society and also for you know this kind of thing i mean this it gives me a platform to be able to discuss things and give my opinions on things and i think that can only be a good thing as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the great thing about being a vet is you have a huge sample size of animals that you've looked at. Like many of us only deal with our own collections or our friends' collections, but when you're a vet, it's like yeah. a rotating door of, of things. Yeah. So as far as your day-to-day, -day, maybe you could lay out what your, your day looks like as a vet. Yeah, well, I only work with exotics these days. So I started off doing dogs and cats and this, the kind of things that most vets do, vaccines and neuters and that sort of thing. But now I just work with exotics and it's predominantly privately owned exotics. So within the field of exotics in the veterinary world, you can become a zoo vet or you can work for an aquarium or something. Um, or you can work in a wildlife center or you can work predominantly with privately owned exotic pets, which is what I do. Um, and... I see, so the species I see, I guess you can broadly divide into three main categories. So the small mammals, the birds, and the reptiles. And I would say reptiles probably about a third of, of what, I, what I do. So um, I tend to have operations and surgery most mornings. Um, and I tend to consult then from sort of midday and in the afternoon and you know, so on an average day, I might have a peregrine falcon to x-ray and I might have a rabbit to castrate <laughs> and I might have a bearded dragon that's 
swallowed something it shouldn't that I've got to remove from its stomach or a bearded dragon with follicular stasis that I've you know got to do a, a hysterectomy on or my, my job can be very very diverse I do a lot of dentistry on rabbits guinea pigs and things um, I might have a fish I might have a frog I might have a tarantula one day um, so it's very very diverse and as well as seeing lots of species I get to be lots of different types of doctor as well mm -hmm. I get to be a dermatologist and an ophthalmologist and an anesthetist and a surgeon and a medic and so it's a very diverse job being an exotic vet yeah that's the crazy thing about being a vet is it's way more generalized than medicine like human medicine because you do yeah. it you have to do everything and that's what I always get amazed at is do, do all vets or most vets are they doing surgeries as well or is that just happen to be some because every vet that I've talked to has also done surgery yeah I think I mean it varies a bit from country to country certainly in the UK um, I mean all vets do some degree of surgery really mm -hmm. yeah um, at least you know the odd cat castrate or something I mean you you graduate as a veterinary surgeon you know mm -hmm. as your official title so you're a surgeon when you graduate um, and and, and I, I enjoy that and, and 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 some vets you know are even more wide-ranging in what they do than me you know some vets treat some exotics and they also treat cats and dogs and they also treat horses and cows and I think it's unbelievable sometimes how they manage to, to be a master of all those things. Um, what I do is actually quite niche compared to what a lot of vets do. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I, I find it amazing, like as far as surgery goes, some of these animals are so small, I just don't understand how you even perform surgery on an animal that's like the size of a chocolate bar or even smaller. Yeah. Is it yeah. difficult? Like obviously it's difficult, but how difficult was it to learn and then how good are you at it? Well, um, it can be difficult. I mean, I've operated on things that are like 12 grams, you know, which is <laughs> like very that. small. And there are a number of challenges. The, the first thing is obviously being able to see what you're doing. Um, and you have to have a lot of dexterity. Um, but there are lots of things that complicate matters, you know, when you're dealing with patients that small. For example, blood loss. Mm. You know, a, a 30 gram budgerigar you know, can probably afford to lose 10 or 12 drops of blood, you know, before it has had a major life-threatening hemorrhage, you know, whereas if you're doing surgery on a dog, it doesn't really matter if there's a little bit of blood here and there, you know, right. it's, it's of no consequence. So um, there are lots of techniques that we use in exotic animal medicine. So we use a lot of microsurgical instruments. So we use very small surgical instruments. Um, we use a lot of magnification. So I often when I'm in theater, I have these crazy like magnifying loops on my face. Um, and, you know, and, and it is just practice and, and familiarity. A, a lot of what I do is not that small and delicate, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm uh, spaying a rabbit or, you know, or something like that is, is, is perfectly doable without magnification. But sometimes, yeah, we have to do some very, very small and delicate things. And it is something that you, you learn, you know, and, and you learn where to rest your elbows and you learn, you know, not to drink the night before and to get enough sleep so that you're not shaking. Um, and you know, and, and, and it's a skill. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm an amazing surgeon, but I, I have, a, I have a lot of experience doing surgery on small things and yeah, it's something that I, I definitely enjoy. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. It almost gives me anxiety thinking about having to work <laughs> on something so small. Do you work on your dexterity outside of the, the, the vet clinic? No, not really. It just happens um, over time. Yeah, I mean, you start off with big things, you know, yeah, you, and, yeah. and you kind of, yeah, you, and as you're doing surgery on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you, you get to be able to do more and more. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So as far as your day-to-day -day experience, what is the, is there a best part? Is there something that you enjoy the most out of being a vet? <laughs> well, I like to fix things. Yeah. I mean, I, li I like it when you have a good outcome, when clearly what you've done, you know, has, has helped um, and you have a healthy animal at the end of it and a happy owner. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, even, even if the animal's not sick, you know, we, we do some preventative medicine, you know, we do some advisory consults. We talk about husbandry and that sort of thing. I think being able to, you know, help an owner who maybe is a bit confused about something, um, to, to sort of come up with the best solution and invest in the best equipment and set things up the right way and help their understanding about what they should be doing for their animal. I think that's hugely rewarding. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's an element of the job I really enjoy as well. 
So how do you know, so you, you deal with such a large spectrum of animals, and like you're saying, a huge part of the job is probably consulting on husbandry. You have somebody coming yeah. in, they bought it from a, on a whim, and now they, they might have an issue. How do you file all this different husbandry techniques in your brain, or do you have to go look up all the time? I guess you have a chart probably what animals coming, and you can look at it before, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, um, I think... Well, I mean, firstly, if you if you pursue further qualifications in the field of exotics, you have to sit exams. And as part of those exams, you have to learn about husbandry of different species. And also, I'm lucky because I have a lot of firsthand experience, too. Mm -hmm. um, most of the species that I see are a sort of species that we see fairly commonly. So, you know, I see a lot of bearded dragons and a lot of corn snakes and a lot of royal pythons or ball pythons, as, as other people call them. Um, and, you know, a lot of African grey parrots and a lot of rabbits and a lot of guinea pigs. And so I kind of, for the, for those species, you know, I've got it in my head because I see those every every day. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I've had to go and, and, and learn, you know, what, what those animals need. And, and as vets, we don't always have all the answers. You know, there's a huge amount of science that, you know, still needs to be done in terms of, you know, being able to work out in a black and white fashion what ideally we should be advising mm -hmm. um i think you know I, I read a lot of books but i also keep up to date with you know things like the advancing herpet herpetological husbandry group and you know and i listen to sort of some of the things that francis baines and roman murin and people like that are coming out with and you know i read the review articles that that are written and i, I try my best to keep to keep up to date with things um and, and even as a vet, sometimes it can be a struggle to keep up with things. You know, I think, um, so for example, when you're talking about reptile lighting, which is a sort of hugely sort of, you know, exciting, interesting sort of area of discussion at the moment. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, I'm sure the majority of people still haven't caught on to, you know, the idea about providing visible light and UVB and UVA and infrared A and infrared B and, you know, and, and, and all this sort of thing, you know, so I think, I think if it, you know, one of the issues that we've got in, in herpetoculture is how we get that information out and disseminate mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but, but, uh, but, but I do my best. And, and so it's a combination of science and books and videos and all sorts of things and firsthand experience really. So l let's talk about that process in general, because this is one of those areas that I think there's a lot of mistrust in the hobby for vets. And, you know, you, yeah. you see it all the time, like oh, my vet told me this and like, don't listen to your vet. Your vet doesn't know anything. So maybe we can, I want to get into how we should be applying vet care for our own animals, but we'll, before we get to that, let's talk about how people can find good vets and how to make sure you're, you can trust your vet and yeah. you can go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I think the first thing is, the first thing I would say is that probably people have a much better understanding of how the human medical field works in terms of who's who, who to go to, kind of the hierarchy of people than maybe they do with the veterinary profession. So if you, basically when it comes to exotics in the veterinary profession, most vets, when they graduate from vet school, will learn the first principles. They'll know about surgical principles and how certain anesthetic drugs work and how to stitch something up and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. But they won't have had extensive training in the non-core species. So at university, you learn about cats and dogs and horses and cows. You don't really get much on bearded dragons or African grey parrots. Right. Um, so, uh, so really, if you're going to see a mainstream average Joe vet who predominantly sees cats and dogs, they may only see one bearded dragon a month or maybe even a year, you know, and you cannot expect somebody who sees one bearded dragon a year and who hasn't done lots of training in that species to be familiar with the husbandry and the disease conditions that those animals get. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a massive misperception you know i think as far as the public is concerned often i think the public think that a vet is a vet and they expect them to be an expert in absolutely all species and that's just really really not the case in reality so i think if you've got an exotic pet um 
go and see an exotic vet. <laughs> I think exotic pets need exotic vets. Yeah. Um, and, and then as far as exotic vets are concerned, you can have very good exotic vets who don't necessarily have any additional qualifications. So they're GP vets and they've, because of their own interest, they've pursued additional continued professional development and they've read a lot and they're seeing lots more of these animals than maybe their cat or dog colleagues. So even though they're not sort of, they don't have a particular status associated with them, um, I still think it pays dividends to go and see somebody who's experienced with exotics. And there are some vets that only see exotics, but even if you see a vet that sees 25% exotics or 50% exotics, you know, I think they're still going to be much in a much better position to deal with the problem than somebody who doesn't really see any exotics at all. And then as well as those sort of general practitioner vets, there are also some additional qualifications that vets can get. So in the UK, in the veterinary profession, there are three tiers. Mm. You've got your GP vets, then you've got your advanced practitioners as a middle tier and then the final tier are the, the specialists, the recognized specialists. And to become a specialist is incredibly, incredibly difficult. You have to pursue years and years of additional training post-graduation. So you have to do a residency um, under the supervision of a specialist in that field. Um, and But um, even if you don't go and see a specialist, you can go and see an advanced practitioner who's somebody that has done a certificate in that particular area of veterinary medicine. So as far as exotics are concerned, that would be called zoological medicine is, is the fancy term for it. So I think um, if you're looking for an exotic vet, find a vet that is experienced, you know, do a Google search, check the relevant veterinary organizations, check the Association of Reptile and Amphibian Veterinarians. They've got a find a vet feature on their website um, or the Association of Avian Vets or whatever it is you, are, you happen to be looking for. Um, and if you can go and see an advanced practitioner or a specialist, if you've got a local you know, person who's that qualified nearby, they have to have a lot of additional knowledge because they wouldn't have passed their exams and they wouldn't have got that status mm -hmm. without without that. So I think, I, I mean, does it does that does does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's very totally. complicated. I think it's a minefield, like for the public to understand. Yes, I know it totally makes sense, and I think you're right. It, it is sort of a minefield, and you know, yeah. you have people that will go take their animal to a totally general vet who's probably 90% yeah. cats and dogs and yeah. get some bad advice and and that's where we almost get like I feel like sometimes vets almost get thrown into the same basket as like chain pet stores like oh don't listen to yeah. pet smart or petco like they're going to give you terrible advice and sometimes vets get tossed into there too which is is unfortunate because there are some great vets out there that we absolutely need to keep the ho hobby healthy yeah, and, and I feel for some of those colleagues, you know, some of those cat and dog vets, because some people just don't see the value in going, in traveling a little bit further. And sometimes they may have to pay a little bit more, you know, exactly. to see someone with a bit more experience. And if somebody's refusing to do that and they and they will only go and see their local cat and dog vet, it puts that cat and dog vet who may not be that familiar with these species in quite a difficult position, you know, and I think... I think most most vets are very good at being open and honest and saying, "Look, I'm I'm not a specialist in this. You know, actually, I don't have a lot of experience." Um, the good news is that we can advise our colleagues. You know, as as exotic vets, you know, and 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 I'm I'm, all, I'm speaking to vets every day and giving them advice. You know, but um, I think there's a lot to be said for for going to see someone who's who's experienced in whatever species it is that you keep. Exactly. I totally yeah. agree. And as, as far as the difference between someone that's classified as a small animal versus an exotic is obviously yeah. exotic is what we're talking about here, but a small animal, just more like your hamster, rat, kind of small mammal. No, type so, so small animal, small animal means cats and dogs. Oh, okay. Exotics means everything that's not a cat or a dog or a farm animal or a horse, basically. So right, okay, ra gotcha. rabbits and guinea pigs and hamsters all come under that designation of exotics as well as the birds and reptiles. Gotcha. So that yeah. is actually a, so, okay. So that's interesting. I, for some reason I thought small animal was just the smaller animal. Well, it <laughs> sounds logical, doesn't it? I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. what you'd logically think. You wouldn't think a, a guinea pig was particularly exotic, but, but yeah. it is as far as the veterinary profession is concerned. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. So then as far as, 
how hobbyists should be applying vet care as just a general practice. What, what are some tips for keeping your collection healthy and, and thriving? Um, well, I think, I think the first thing to say is, you know, every animal, as far as I'm concerned, sh- that is kept in captivity should be entitled to veterinary care if it gets sick. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're keeping animals, register with a local exotic vet, have a plan in place, know where it is you're going to go, should you ever find that you have a sick animal. And I think it's a good idea to build up a rapport and a relationship with your exotic vet. You know, you can send them emails and ask them for, you know, for for, for what you should be doing. Should, do I need to come in? You know, does this need to be seen? Or could, is there any advice you can provide you know, just just to prevent a problem maybe from escalating or getting worse. Um, so I think I think I think there's that side of things. I think knowing where to go. I think then there are just some some general common sense principles. I mean, I think you know one thing I would say is make sure you quarantine all new arrivals. You know, mm-hmm. don't don't put a new animal in with the bulk of your collection. Keep it separate. I mean, even if you don't have a separate room where you can keep it, you know, keep it in. A different enclosure on the other side of the room, away from all your other animals. Make sure you're using sensible biosecurity protocols. Wash your hands, you know, between handling that animal. Don't use the same feeding utensils. Don't use the same. Don't mix water bowls. You know, don't if you feed a snake a, a rat and and it refuses it, and you know that snake is a new snake and it's in quarantine. Don't then go and feed that rat to you know, one of your other animals because you don't want it to go to waste because that's a brilliant way to, to spread disease. So I think quarantine is hugely important. Um, I think know some of the common infectious conditions that that particular species is prone to. So, you know, as far as boa constrictors are concerned, for example, I think arena virus, you know, which causes this nasty disease called IBD should be on every boa keeper's radar. And mm-hmm. ideally, you know, if you buy a new boa, test it you know and and the same if you buy a green tree python you know test it for nidovirus which is a huge infectious disease that affects those if you're keeping amphibians you know you you should consider some chytrid testing maybe for new arrivals um and i think you know checking animals for parasites routinely you know i think i think at least at least once a year ideally twice a year ideally you know send a fecal off and and just mm-hmm. check you don't you aren't dealing with a parasite problem and, you know, and have a first aid kit maybe would be another another piece of advice I'd give. Have some iodine that you can clean a wound with, um, you know, and and it's just principles like that. You know, I think I think I think those would be my top th- top four tips, however mm-hmm. many tips that was. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's great. Oh, so what about um, as far as checkups go? Like, what are your thoughts there? If, should, should people be bringing their animals in for a yearly checkup? Or do you think a, a yearly fecal is better to, to go and just kind of pay attention? I guess the question is, when should an animal be brought into the clinic? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think a, a health check by a vet is always a good idea. I mean, we as vets are very used to picking up on subtle signs of early illness. So right. I think having a physical exam where a vet looks in the animal's mouth and it looks in the coena, which is the slit in the roof of the mouth or the opening to the glottis and you know palpating the abdomen and having a listen with a stethoscope, I think that's hugely beneficial. I think that's a great way to pick up potential problems before they get worse before they cause clinical disease often um i think but i think you know i think if you're in a position to do that for all your animals as long as it's not one of these very delicate species that is likely to get very stressed with the handling and the transport and everything else i think i would recommend an annual health check for all reptiles if you're in a position to do it and i think certainly pet keepers you know people keeping a bearded dragon or a corn snake i i think they they should all be going to see their vet once a year for a health check i think if you've got a very very large collection um it may not always be practical to take a hundred animals into the vet um but I think, um, you know, you could even consider whether you have an annual visit from the vet or at least, um, you know, if, if you've got sick animals, you know, it, it might be that from a population medicine point of view, you know, your vet is able to sort of look at photos of your setup and your collection and sort of identify areas where, you know, there could be a disease transmission risk and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think I think 
ideally all animals would be checked at least once a year by a vet. And I think I think definitely that should be the case for, for people that just have, you know, a few animals. So yeah. and then you also mentioned having an at home first aid kit, which I think is a, a great idea. I, mm. But that's probably a thin line between people doing at home surgery and people doing at home wound care. Yeah. So where are you as a vet comfortable with people ch- treating their animals at home without necessarily bringing them in? Like, is there certain small, you know, skin lesions and whatnot, or maybe burns, or should they always be brought in and then at home treatment should take place? I mean, I think if it's a small superficial wound and you want to clean it with some tamadine, I think that's perfectly acceptable, you know, and obviously if things aren't getting better, if it's swelling up, if it's getting pussy or whatever, then I think, you know, clearly you need to consult the vet. Um, I wouldn't really advocate anybody does any kind of surgical procedure at home, <laughs> yeah. really, you know, and, and and you see some videos on YouTube and you just think, oh yes. my goodness, yeah. Um, and, and sometimes it's really experienced breeders that are doing things like that. And you just think this is like, this is setting a really, a really bad example. This is like Joe exotic style, um, yes. on YouTube. <laughs> well, I, I, I know Kevin McCurley just posted a video not that long ago of just this wild at home surgery they did with that leucistic cobra. Was it, is it a King Cobra? I forget what it is, but it, it's a ven- I think it's a King Cobra. And yeah, he was like cutting out, uh, I think it was a parasite or something under the scales, but it was like, or it was an inflamed fang. Or it was crazy. And it, it just yeah. seemed like if you have, I don't, a I don't know. I mean, I, 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 it's difficult. I don't think I've seen that particular example, but I, I just think if you're, if you need to cut anything open, that's probably best done by somebody who is clinically trained. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> and and if for some reason you think you're okay at doing it, at least don't post it on YouTube and show everybody like yeah, how you can so take the scalpel and cut in yeah, there it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one but yes i mean yeah i think it's i think the thing is a bit, bit bit dodgy isn't it yeah yeah so as, as far as the common illnesses and, and conditions you see brought in like you're saying you, you see a lot of the same species are a lot yeah. of those same species experiencing the same ailments yeah often um so i can give you a few examples yes um i see a lot of mediterranean tortoises i don't know do, is that a thing in canada do people keep a lot of tortoises um, it's, it's not as crazy, I think, just because no. we don't have the outside conditions for it. Yeah. So people just don't really, well, we don't, have... we don't really, yeah, either, that's but, true. But actually, yeah. maybe, maybe you to more, more of an extent because of all the snow and everything else. Yeah. Um, no, we have a lot of people that keep tortoises here in the UK. And, um, so I see an awful lot of respiratory disease in tortoises. Um, so they get mycoplasma, they get mm-hmm. this sort of inf- this infectious disease that like is so, so common. So I see loads of horses with runny noses and runny eyes and swollen eyes. That's that's one example of, of something I see day in, day out. Um, I see, I, sadly, I still see quite a bit of metabolic bone disease in leopard geckos. Mm-hmm. I hardly ever see it in bearded dragons and I very rarely see it in many other men most other species but for some reason i think it's because people have this idea still that leopard geckos don't really need any lighting you know a lot a lot of the books that are on the shelf still you know recommend keeping a leopard gecko with with a heat map for example as as the heating source and they advise that actually no lighting is required and Mm. you know whereas with a snake you know snakes the fact is you know yes uv can be beneficial and you know, and that's a whole other subject. But snakes don't really commonly suffer with metabolic bone disease if they're not provided with UV light. But leopard right. geckos do. You mm-hmm. know, leopard geckos are very prone to it. So, sadly, I see quite a few leopard geckos still that have soft jaws. You know, and and sort of deformed limbs, and 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 that's kind of sad. And um, I think that's one example of an issue in the hobby that probably s- still needs to be solved. Really, in terms of. Uh, some education on that front you know i th- i think that's one thing i would advise on this video that's one of my my sort of take home messages is ideally if you're keeping leopard geckos you know provide some uvb lighting to them mm-hmm. because it will be hugely beneficial um so yeah i mean i see a lot i see obesity in some species like bosque monitors like almost every bosque monitor i see is obese yeah. sadly and it's because they need a lot of space they're very big lizards and, you know, and it's difficult to provide them with the space that they need in captivity. And so a lot of owners sadly fail on that front. I mean, thankfully, they're not a mainstream species. They're not a species that's widely kept, but they are kept now and again. Um, and the other thing is, you know, boss monitors predominantly actually eat insects and a lot of people feed them on rodents and right. 
various other things, you know, and, and so, 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 yeah, I mean, I see a lot of obese corn snakes. I think people feed corn snakes on giant rats when actually they could probably be feeding much smaller mice. Mm-hmm. And way too um, frequent as well. And way too frequent, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, those are some examples of things that that I guess I would I would commonly see. What else do I see? I don't I don't think that. Yeah. I'm, a lot of what I see is is sort of you know the odd case here and there. It's not the case that every consult I see, I'm like, oh, another one of these. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I think those would be some examples of some common sort of problems I'd see day in day out. It's- the interesting, like with the UV and the leopard gecko is interesting because it's so, actually supplementing them with, with synthetic vitamins is actually a pretty complicated process and, and p- supplying UV really simplifies that. You can really cut down on the amount of synthetic vitamin D if you still want to provide it, I guess every once in a while you can, but it's not like a life or death situation where because they're synthesizing it themselves and it's so much simpler and the fact that you're still seeing this all the time really says that we haven't got there yet with the yeah. advice. But, you know, a lot of people that are against reptile keeping, you know, will say, well, you know, vets are still very, very commonly seeing metabolic bone disease and it's a disaster. And I think uh, coming from the other side, you know, I actually don't see that much metabolic bone disease these days. And I think the leopard geckos are, for me, are the the main problem that I see still. You know, I I think people are starting to get it right with bearded dragons. Um, but I think I think leopard geckos people still have a way to go. And yes, there are some breeders that don't provide UV and that don't have metabolic bone disease issues. And if you're really really hot on your supplementation, you know, if you're gut loading your insects really really well and you're giving calcium and activated vitamin D three supplements, you can probably get away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you say, you know, a UV light is inexpensive and you know and 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 also is is natural for 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 leopard geckos you know they they're exposed to sunlight in the wild you know and exposed to to uvb radiation so why not provide it Mm -hmm. um yeah so and and getting to the the obese corn snakes i think snakes are one of those areas where it's actually difficult for people to tell that their snakes are overweight just by the way they hold their fat and often when you can yeah. tell that they're fat they're already really really obese so yeah. are there some ways that people can feel or you know <laughs> optically tell that their snakes are overweight or is there is it more of a can you guys tell on an x-ray or or what's the deal well we use like typically we'd use a sort of body condition scoring system so we'd often condition score a snake on a scale of one to five um, so, um, three would be ideal, two would be thin, one would be emaciated, four would be overweight and five would be obese. And there are sort of various things that we look at as vets in terms of the shape of the back. And there are actually some diagrams that you can find in different places where that people have, you know, come up with a sort of crude condition scoring and they've drawn little cross sections. I think, I think for people at home, um, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, sometimes I think it's quite obvious if the animal's morbidly obese, <laughs> Um, and I don't think you need to be a vet to see. I think if um, I think often if they're developing a real prominent ridge along their back, and it sort of almost looks like you can see their spine, but it's not. It's the the body sort of curving in. I think if there's a ridge on the back, that that could be a sort of flags up. Is the animal a little bit overweight? Um, but I think it's difficult. I think I think I think it's experience and. Um, yeah, I, but this is an, another reason why people should go and see their vet once a year, you know, and 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 get advice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that is a tough one, and I think people tend to overfeed, so it it can be. You, we see a lot of heavier snakes in the hobby, so there's no yeah. no way to con- compare them to good body conditions a lot of the time. Which and, and a lot of these animals aren't meant to be fed sort of heavily through all through the year. You know, naturally they would have a period of brumation or hibernation. You know, where they would stop eating for many weeks and. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of things to consider. <laughs> yeah. So, what about you? Kind of mentioned some of those viruses, nidovirus, and and, and I, IBD and all these IBD. things. And so, how much of an issue do you think this is? Because this is an area that I think we as the hobby are not doing a great job on, as far as biosecurity is concerned. And you, yeah. know, you think even things like reptile expos could be a, could be a little bit of a question mark at this point when we start, especially now with the whole coronavirus thing, we start thinking about these things differently. And especially in the States, things get traded and swapped and flown across the country so quickly and easily. Their weather really, you know, they can ship all the time and they have these massive expos. So as far as you're concerned, how much of an issue or or 
reason to worry is are, are these sort of viruses well they are a problem you know and and um and i and again you know trying to think of the the, the best solution is is difficult i mean i um I mean, what I will say is a lot of these viruses in reptiles are spread by direct contact with bodily fluids. So um, if you go to an expo, you know, I can guarantee if you go to a reptile show, there will be arena virus and there will be needle virus in that room. I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think if the animals are in closed containers and if you're regularly disinfecting your hands and you disinfect your hands between handling every animal, I still think the transmission of those diseases, you know, the transmission risk actually is, is still probably quite low. Mm. Uh, that's not the situation for birds, by the way, because most bird viruses are airborne. And so bird shows are a complete nightmare because you've got birds oh, okay. flapping and wire cages and dust floating about everywhere i mean biosecurity is much more difficult but i think yeah i think with i think with reptile shows actually as long as you're sensible and you disinfect your hands i, I think the transmission risk is still quite low and that's from the point of view of transmission between tables and between animals but um the, the the question is then you know well what if you're buying animals and yes there is a risk that you're going to bring in you know those viruses you know and I, and I think it's a case of you know testing and quarantine and if you're not sure what protocol should be in place or what you should be doing speak to an exotic vet basically who will be able to advise you yeah yeah proper yeah. biosecurity bringing animals in is really crucial and testing yeah. and and long quarantines and what people don't often have patience for but that is really what you need to make yeah. sure you don't spread that and some of these viruses you know can be dormant for months mm -hmm. sometimes even years you know and so even even if you're quarantining sometimes for four weeks or six weeks you know it's it doesn't it's not foolproof it's not it's not you know the, 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 things can still slip through the cracks um, I think I think for some of those things, I think for both of those diseases that you mentioned, nidovirus and arenavirus, I mean, I think keepers should be testing their animals in quarantine, ideally. Yeah. Um, particularly if they've got a lot of animals. I mean, it's just crazy to be, you know, if you've got boas, I mean, some some keepers will may have may have it in their collection already, you know, and and they may not be that worried. They may they may say, well, I know I've got it, and you know, and uh, you know, I'll I'll cut my losses and. You know, it's important to remember as well that with both of those viruses, nidovirus and arenavirus, not all animals will go on to develop disease. Mm -hmm. um, and if people are open and honest and they say, look, you know, I have arenavirus in my collection, but none of my animals are currently sick. Um, and, and, you know, and, and people want to trade amongst that, but there's that transparency, then I, then I think, I think fair enough. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a difficult one. Should we, should we euthanize all, all boa constrictors that are positive for, for arena virus? Well, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of snakes that are out there, you know, mm -hmm. but I think, I think keepers should make a reasonable attempt to keep them out of their collections. And I think if you've got a few boas, test them all. And if you find they are negative, um, test them again in a few months and if they're still all negative then you are you want to be careful about what you're bringing in yeah you know and and if you've got a negative collection and you're buying in new snakes i mean it would be stupid not to test them at least twice before you put them into your co collection yeah i think that's yeah. so so right and I, i'm hoping that yeah. becomes more of a, a common practice because especially with collections growing larger and larger these days and yeah you know, it's just it doesn't make sense if we, we can slow the virus spread down a lot like you're saying if just keeping those animals isolated and and not yeah and i mean so much. maybe we'll get to a point where people will sell you know boas and pythons for example with with testing certificates yeah um certainly in in aviculture you know with parrots for example it's very common to buy a parrot that's been tested for citizen beak and feather disease and born virus and chlamydia and all these diseases that parrots commonly get i mean maybe we'll get to that point with reptiles the difficulty then is you need to trust whoever's done it to have taken the swab from the right place right um and not just swabbed their shoe or something or sent a blank swab <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So, in in the parrot in the bird world, do people trust the certificate? Is or is yeah. there still kind of a mistrust? Well, I think, and and often in the parrot world, you know, it, it, the disease testing will be done by by a vet, and I think that gives it a bit more credibility as well. Mm. 
it's 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 tricky because obviously that you know everything everything costs you know and and yeah. if you want to do things properly in reptile keeping if you want to keep your animals with a high level of husbandry and if you want to provide them with good medical care and disease prevention you know probably the value of animals needs to increase you know a lot of these animals are just far too cheap to justify a lot of these things i think i mean i think we've massively devalued a lot of a lot of these animals you know but but actually i would like to see a situation where people can charge more for their animals but actually do things better and keep them with more space and provide better preventative health care yeah i completely agree i think having really inexpensive snakes doesn't really help the hobby at all and and that's always one of the tropes that breeder, breeders say. It's like, well, how are we going to, we want to have the, you know, the snakes affordable, but that might not be the actual answer. So as, as far as your, we, uh, let's talk about your collection. What do you currently yes. have uh, at home and what are you keeping? Um, I keep, I keep snakes these days. I don't keep any lizards um, or chelonia, partly because I'm so busy and snakes fit in really well with my lifestyle. I think snakes are actually for quite low maintenance compared to some of the other reptile taxa. Oh, so yeah. I keep snakes. <laughs> um, I have a particular passion for Australian pythons. So I love carpet pythons. Um, I love that Morelia genus. Mm -hmm. um, I really like Anteresia as well. Do you know those snakes? Like yeah, dwarf just the pygmy Australia. pythons. Yeah, yeah, like the pygmy and children from Spot and Stimson's pythons. So I keep, I keep those. Um, I have one or two other things. Like I have a pet olive python. I have no intention of breeding my olive python. I just have, have one as a pet. Um, and I keep some ball pythons as well, just for fun. So you have a little bit of everything and I totally yeah. agree. It's, it's funny how even I have, you know, only four snakes and a couple of geckos and my geckos are way more maintenance than my snakes. And it's, I always think like in the future, I probably won't buy as much as I love lizards. It's just, you know, feeders and feeder insects are such a pain and you can be way more diverse with the diet more easily with snakes. Like you can have yeah. whatever in your freezer and yeah. it's amazing how much time lizards take out. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I also keep, um, I've got one colubrid species. I keep San Diego mountain king snakes. Oh, cool. Um, which are really cool, like black and red and yellow banded snakes that don't get more than about three feet in length and have a very gentle disposition. I, I love those, but very uncommon in the hobby. So how many do you have? What, what is the total size as far as your animals? I, I ha I, so I have about 36 or 37 okay. snakes. So that's a fair size. Yeah. It's and not you, hundreds. I yeah, think that's yeah. about the limit. I think for somebody who works full time and wants to provide good care, I mean, I think, I think it's difficult to have many more than that. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It becomes a full-time job in itself. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know you do some breeding as well. And so yeah. that's something I wanted to talk to you about because it, breeding is this part of the hobby where it's exciting and it's fun and it's a way we can advance ourselves. Like once you master the husbandry, I know keepers really yearn to, to do something that's more complicated and, and that breeding fits that perfectly. But a lot of times I think people don't do it responsibly because they overproduce things like ball pythons are getting produced like crazy and they're fulfilling a part of them that wants to engage in the hobby more deeply without thinking about the consequences. And I think you have a, a method of appropriate breeding, we can call it. So maybe you could talk about the, the process that you go through so you can sort of fulfill that exciting part without creating way too many snakes i think it's just common sense isn't it i think you've <laughs> yeah. just got to, i just think you've got to think about what you're breeding and whether you're going to be able to find good responsible homes for those animals so um i don't breed very much um i think last year i bred i had four clutches of snakes now one of those clutches was um were my eastern stimpson's pythons um there is not a massive surplus of Eastern Stimpson's pythons out there. They're a very small, easy to manage snake, and a lot of people want to keep them. And there will always be people that are interested in providing, you know, good homes for for those for those snakes. So I know I'll always be able to find homes for for those. Um, I bred uh, Sri Lanka pythons because those are incredibly, incredibly rare to the point where they are almost extinct in the hobby. Um, they're also a Cites appendix one species and are threatened in the wild. And I, I don't know, I, I, I felt I could make a conservation argument for breeding those. Um, and then, you know, so, some of the carpet pythons, you know, I, I, I may not breed them every year if I think I'm going to struggle to sell them. But if, if I know there are people that, that want, that want to have them, then I, I think, I think, I think, you know, as long as, as long as you've you feel you can rehome them. And if you're in a position where you can't find homes for them, you have to be prepared to keep them for as long as it takes. Exactly. You know, and you have to you have to have the space to do that. So I think 
Um, I would say don't breed for the sake of it. Um, there is much more to the hobby than just breeding. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that some people maybe don't provide the high standard of care that they may otherwise is because they're so focused on what they're going to produce. And actually, if they were more interested in what the conditions that they provide to their existing animals, you know, and they took more pride and joy in that and watching those animals, you know, observing new behaviors and interacting with, you know, bigger space. And, you know, I think, I think, I think that would be a really positive thing for animal welfare. So I think enjoy keeping, you know, don't just focus on what you can breed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think ideally, you know, only produce things that you know you've got homes lined up for already or that you or that you can comfortably say i will be able to find homes for those animals and if you can't find homes for them you need to be in a position to to house them for as long as as long as necessary i think those would be my 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 recommendations for responsible breeding yeah no i, yeah. I totally agree and I, I think i see this it's almost a symptom of the breeder world with these instagram pages where you'll scroll scroll through an instagram an instagram page and you'll just see different snakes being held in their hands and whatnot like these are great pages and i'm not saying anything bad about these people but you just see the snake 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 where if you go to the fish side you're going to see beautiful aquarium beautiful aquarium amazing schooling fish acting natural and it's like how weird would it be to, to fall into an aquarium page that's just like somebody holding a discus fish in their hand for the whole page so it, it sort of highlights the difference between focusing on only the offspring rather than focusing on the hobby or herpetoculture as a package and yeah. I think that those Instagram pages almost highlight that perfectly. I think what you're saying sort of fits in with that. Use it as a fun project to tinker with, but also remember what you're doing when you're bringing new lives into the world. Yeah. And if you want to breed things, you know, breed things, there actually is a demand for, you know, mm -hmm. if breeding low value ball python morphs now is, you can almost argue is to some extent irresponsible because there there is so much byproduct out there. You know, it's it's and it's sad to be referring to animals as byproduct, but you know, finding homes for all those male pastels and you know and, and male yellow belly ball pythons and just the lower end of the market. I mean, I think I think I think can, can be difficult. You know, and and you've got to be prepared to keep those animals for as, as long as needed. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if I breed my Arizona, my sorry, San Diego mountain king snakes, you know, there is a massive demand for those because there aren't many about you know if, if you particularly want to breed i think breed something that's scarce and ideally you know if you are breeding things um and 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 if space is at a premium you know breed things that are small you know mm -hmm. small snake big market big snakes small market you know <laughs> yeah yeah, I totally agree. And that, yeah. that kind of leads me into that. The next thing I wanted to chat with you about was we each kind of did a video on enclosure size. Yes. And I referenced yours in the video that I did because I think it was great. And I I think that small snake model fits perfectly into sort of the video that each of us did because it's so much easier to provide an appropriate space for a smaller animal. And yeah. we, we really ought to be keeping more of those. So what prompted you to, so if for anyone that's listening, the video was you just sort of did a, a really great presentation. I think it was like 40 minutes and you went through all sort of the data and information on appropriate enclosure size for snakes. So what prompted you to, to make that? Well, um, in the UK, we had a new piece of legislation come into law called the Animal Activities Licensing Scheme, which was, um, it set minimum standards for pet shops and for reptiles in pet shops. And one of the things that they put in there was um, a, a minimum enclosure size for snakes. And that was much bigger than what a lot of keepers were providing. And because it's a, a therefore a legal requirement, you know, a lot of people were up in, in arms and there was a lot of controversy. And as a vet who's also a keeper, naturally people started to ask me, you know, what my opinion was on, on, on that whole debate. Um, so I kind of got roped into it and corralled into it. And uh, it's, it's really difficult for me because I, I can come at it from both angles. Um, bigger is always better. There is no doubt and we should aspire to keep animals in large enclosures so that we can provide them with you know, the best opportunity to thermoregulate and the best choice possible when it comes to different microenvironments and, 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 and all the rest of it. I mean, I think, you know, but, but equally, we need to 
establish what an acceptable minimum is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think I think that's the challenge. Now, um, in the, so in the UK, what they basically said was the enclosure size needs to be as long as the snake, which I think is fine as a principle, but has some weaknesses um, as a rule. And I don't know, I just kind of got into it and started thinking about it and... You know, so for example, I think snakes need to have decent sized enclosures, but um, you know, keeping a 16 foot Burmese python in a vivarium that's 16 foot long by five foot wide by five foot high maybe isn't as good as keeping it in a 14 foot by 14 foot by 14 foot room that maybe still has an internal diagonal where the snake is able to fully stretch itself out. So I, I kind of I kind of thought, well, are we defining it in the best way? And um, and also it's really interesting to consider some of the science behind it. There is hardly any science, you know, to so it's it all comes down to people's opinions. Mm-hmm. And um and I think I think that's that's really challenging really when it comes to to setting laws. So so I think basically my position is we should keep snakes in big enclosures. We should allow them the ability to stretch their bodies out, you know, because we do that for every other species, birds, dogs. Why should snakes be different? You know, yeah. snakes in the wild have the opportunity to stretch themselves out. People say they don't stretch themselves out and they don't ramrod straighten themselves out very often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they do, but they do almost stretch themselves out reasonably commonly. And we've got science to say that. Um, so I think I think there should be at least one internal dimension within the cage where they can do that, mm-hmm. um, and and but but I think the animal rights organisations are jumping on the debate to try and limit reptile keeping and to try and prohibit reptile keeping to some extent. They will try and make things as difficult as possible for people so that less people do it. And I have some concerns about that as well, because I actually think there are lots of benefits to this hobby. I'm very for reptile keeping, as long as it's done in a responsible way. And um, and, and it's something I feel quite strongly about. You know, I, I do feel like, you know, we, we, need to, we need to argue about the benefits of, of the hobby. And I can see there's an ulterior motive in some of these arguments. Does that yeah. make sense? No, so, that, that I, yeah. totally makes sense, yeah. In some ways, I feel a bit conflicted because I come at this as a vet and I want the best welfare for the snakes, but I also want to protect the hobby. And I also think that from a wider animal welfare point of view, if you if you ban something and it goes underground, you know, I just I just worry about the, the welfare implications, you know, of, of animals. Well, it's interesting in that you say that. I've just recorded two podcasts sort of in a row with Australian keepers and they obviously have yeah. some of the strictest laws and, yeah. and and I ask them how how well does it work and both of them are like it doesn't uh, doesn't work because people they, just they've break got the corn rules. snakes and boa constrictors everywhere in there I hear <laughs> exactly that's, that's exactly what they said so it becomes yeah. this it becomes a thing where the people who follow the rules are following them and then you create a sort yeah. of an underbelly of people not doing yeah. things properly so then it, as far as that legislation goes the the length rule. Yeah, and your video actually recommends. I guess you you do have the recommend, but you kind of walk through the mathematics to show people that you can still hit a, a full length of a snake if you go from corner it, to corner. Yeah, I mean it's 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 all opinion. I mean, in my opinion, mm-hmm. and um, if you read the latest textbook on reptile medicine, which is written by Divers and Stahl, which is a very very impressive, very comprehensive book, um, they would they would take a similar a similar view. You know, so I think. I think we should be aiming for for that benchmark, which is what you know experienced vets in the in the reptile you know sector are recommending. But we have to be careful that we don't set the minimum bar too high as well, because mm-hmm. we will see because because you will see animal welfare consequences as a result. If if suddenly thousands of people are falling short of you know of the, the minimum standard that is that is going to have implications for animal welfare yeah it's it's so true it's kind of funny how sometimes we think a, a piece of legislation to help welfare will help the animals but a lot of times it does the exact opposite sort of yeah. count in a counterintuitive way so as far as your you know you when you walk through that mathematics going from like a top corner to a bottom corner yeah you, that still allows a snake to fully stretch out does that would that be included in in that legislation we're ha- having a full length or does that not because the actual enclosure is not as long as the snake 
No, that so in the UK, it w- it will be uh, this legislation is only for pet shops. Okay, but in some but in some ways that sets the bar even higher for long term keepers because a pet shop is a temporary situation. So if exactly. you have to keep a snake in one times the length in a pet shop, then think what you know. Then that's the very minimum somebody in the private sector would would have to would have to do. I just I I would like, but personally, and this is only my my view, and and it's this is a controversial subject, and people get very upset by it. Um. I don't like the idea of keeping, you know, a, a, a five foot snake in a, you know, two and a half foot plastic box with a water bowl and a heat mat mm-hmm. and a piece of newspaper, you know, and, and so I think any legislation that sort of tries to move us away from that, personally, I think is positive for animal welfare. But I don't. But equally, I don't want to get to a situation. So a lot of my clients and my and the owners that come and see me, you know, will keep their four foot two inch ball python or four foot three inch corn snake in a four foot vivarium, you know, and they'll have a UV light and they'll have multiple hides and they'll have a water bowl. And yes, yeah. that's probably a minimum. You know, it would be nicer to see the animal in a five foot or a six foot viv. But I don't. I don't want. I don't want those four foot two inch ball pythons to. You know, f- f- for those owners to suddenly find they're doing something illegal. You know, because mm-hmm. I. I just don't think that's helpful. And and yeah. I don't think we've got the science to say that that is the case. You know, should we discover and should we be able to prove scientifically that those animals' welfare needs are not being met? Then that's a different story. But in 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 ab- in the absence of good science to demonstrate that, you know, I, I I think we've got to be careful. So it's coming up with the right minimum. It's a hugely controversial issue. It's um it's it's being discussed at the moment in Parliament. There are working groups looking at it, um, and so it'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, and I totally agree. And I recommend everybody go and watch your video because you did a great job laying it all out. And and yeah, and I, I agree with the conclusion that you came to. And that was one of the reasons that I made my video as well, because I, I want people to start thinking of some of the smaller species, or at least in, in the West, we have, I don't know what it's like in the UK, but we have so many people giving, keeping huge bodied heavy yeah. bodied animals and it's like I, th- I think i saw your video you were talking about the the volume of the snake right. weren't you in relation to the volume of the of the enclosure i thought i thought it was a really interesting take on it you know in terms of yeah and, and i think i think basically your conclusion was if you're keeping snakes in your average pet situation keep smaller species exactly and, yeah. and i think i think that's a golden piece of advice i mean i think i think you can meet the welfare needs of large constrictors but realistically you're going to have to give them a room exactly you know yeah. and you can you can't keep 300 reticulated pythons you know in a, in a building in the garden and you know and, and and have good welfare for those snakes i mean those snakes need to climb they need to immerse themselves in water they need to you know they they they're fairly active snakes you know they're not like ball pythons and they're yeah. very very large mm-hmm. you know so so yeah i mean i i'm i'm in full agreement there I, I I often think what what is the best way forward? You know how how can we best advise people? I think some sort of a panel would be a good idea where we have experienced keepers and vets and maybe some people from the the clubs and societies that all kind of work together to come up with a, as much of an evidence based you know set of guidelines that is peer reviewed. You know, I, I I I think I think if there was if if we could set something like that up, I think that would be fantastic for the hobby. I think that would be the best way for the hobby to police itself. I I totally agree. I think I've always said self policing is absolutely the way we want to go. We want to have like a high tier standard that trickles down because the person that goes to Petco to buy their first leopard gecko is not going to start with a high level of care. That's totally fine as long as we have a funnel of information that will get to them at some point. Yeah. And if 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 we don't have a good guideline at the top then it doesn't ever get to that person. And then we have, like you said, animal rights groups coming in and government legislation trying to control the hobby. And that will not result, not be a good result for us. It'd be much better if we actually took the stand and, and made the rules ourselves. Yeah. And and so and I and so I've mentioned AHH advancing her husbandry already once in this podcast, but mm. Um, they sort of make so that's a, a group you can follow them on Facebook and it's a group that promotes sort of high standards of husbandry not just the bare minimum and they have expressed an interest in becoming a formalized 
organization or, or club or society. And, you know, and I've offered to help in any way I can with that movement, because I think, I think that's what we need. There are a lot of organizations that fight for the hobby politically because mm -hmm. it gets so much stick from animal rights activists. But I think there's a bit of a gap in that we need organizations that, you know, look at the husbandry and they look at welfare science and they put out information that people know they can rely on because it's peer reviewed that gives guidelines on what we should be doing. That's so true. Yeah, we have those those groups that are fighting for our rights, which is great, but sometimes it's hard to trust them because they just fight for the hobby just for the sake of fighting for the hobby and they don't actually analyze welfare. And that's the problem is there's so much politics mm -hmm. that some some of the things that the animal rights organizations to say say to some extent actually we we probably should listen to. Yeah. You know, and but uh, but when you're in a political fight you know, you, you kind of want to be defensive against everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I, you know, so I, th I think a lot of it gets lost in the politics, sadly. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. Well, let's start to wrap up here. I want to finish off with one yeah. more quick topic that kind of is controversial in itself, and that's morphs. So I yeah. want to hear what your opinion on morphs are and sort of when are they okay and when do we need to start kind of drawing a line, if you've thought about this. Well, again, it's only my opinion. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with morphs as a rule. But I think, I think there are some things to say about morphs. The first thing is I am totally against the breeding of any morph that has a physical impediment or physiological impediment. You know, I, I think it's unethical for us to be breeding spider ball pythons is my honest opinion. And, and as a vet and a keeper, you know, that's, that's the conclusion I've come to. I think it's unethical to be breeding animals. And yes, not every spider ball python has compromised welfare. Some of them have a very, very subtle neurological condition to the point where it's barely noticeable. But others struggle to keep the head in the right place, you know, and you open the enclosure and the snake wants to look at you and it wants to see what you're doing and it wants to taste the air with its tongue and it wants to get the heat signature and an infrared image using its heat pits, but it can't because you open it up and what you see is the underside of the snake's head and it kind of moves back on itself, you know, and it's, that must be stressful for the animal, you know, to be in that position where it can't control itself. Um, so I think, and, and you don't know, it's luck of the draw. You can breed two spiders together that don't have any neurological signs or it's very, very subtle. And you can produce animals that are very severely neurologically impaired. So I think, I think if we want to be responsible, we have to move away from morphs that have problems. Mm -hmm. I'm not a massive fan of scaleless reptiles. You know, I think, yeah. I think, I think that impedes animals. I mean, you know, silk back bearded dragons, you know, I've seen so many problems caused by poor sheds you know, wounds, digits going necrotic, you know, it must be so uncomfortable for those animals. I, so I, so yeah, I mean, anything with a problem I'm kind of against completely. I think if, if a morph doesn't have a problem, um, it, it can be a very cool looking snake. I mean, I have some pied ball pythons here and I just keep them because they're just so cool to look at, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and they have good welfare and good husbandry. And, and so why not? Um, I think, one of the negative aspects of keeping morphs, as I've mentioned previously, is that you end up producing a lot of byproducts along yeah. the along the, the when you're searching for the latest and greatest combination, and and if you're doing that, you just need to be careful and responsible, and you need to make sure that all of the animals you produce you can find good homes for. And yeah, I'm not massively in favour of keeping hundreds and hundreds of snakes in a room in, in small plastic boxes, which I think is one of the reasons why the hobby can absorb all those byproducts at the moment is because mm -hmm. people just stick them in a small tub. So true. Yeah. And if we want to do things better, we have to be more responsible with, with our breeding really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty much totally agree. I mean, there, there are seemingly some very stable morphs. I mean, ball or piebald is a, a morph that pops up in several different species and it's yeah. fairly stable. We see it in rats and horses and, and, yeah. and, and, and dogs, obviously, and, and it's fairly stable. Same with hyper and hypomelanism. Those things seem to be very stable, but there's certainly a wide array of other genetic mutations that we're playing kind of evil scientists with that probably we shouldn't be perpetuating. I think there are good things and bad things about morphs is how I would summarize it. I mean, mm -hmm. the other good thing about morphs is it's leading to the domestication of certain species. 
And I think from the point of view of people keeping pet reptiles at home, having an animal which is to some extent domesticated and several generations captive bred, you know, is, uh, I mean, I'm sure ball pythons that are being produced today are behaviorally and in terms of their feeding response and, you know, because they've, they've been bred because of this interest in morphs, I think they probably make better captives for a, a pet keeper than maybe yeah. something which isn't so domesticated. I, I think that maybe is a positive that I would that I would argue, you know, has come of morphs that maybe not many people pick up on. The other thing is because so many people keep one species or two species, like ball pythons, for example, there is a lot more literature from the medical side in those species. Right. So, so we're probably able to advise a bit more about what painkillers work best in ball pythons, you know, compared to what we would about a San Diego mountain king snake. You know, there's a lot more medical research and, and literature. And I think a lot of that has resulted from the morph craze and, and the fact that people are keeping these animals in such a mainstream way. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I used to think, oh, these animals can't be domesticated. It's just not possible. And then I, I was listening to Nick Mutton, who's a, a big breeder, a carpet python yeah. breeder in the States. And he was explaining the, you know, some of the definitions of, of domestication. And part of that is, you know, breeding more readily. You're going through more breeding cycles in a year. And, and, and actually color morphs is a part of domestication as well. So th they are actually being actively domesticated. And, and morphs in some way are just a manifestation of that process happening. Yeah. And I think for the novice keeper, you know, keeping a species which is more domesticated and which, you know, people want fancy colors. And I'm sure the fact that they're keeping snakes which are brightly colored is is attractive to them. But because that's that snake is is more domesticated as a result, I think that's probably better for the animal as well. And certainly from the veterinary care point of view. But that's not to say I'm against people keeping, you know, naturalistic, pure species. In fact, that's my main interest. Mm -hmm. And I think, but I think those are probably more suited to the serious enthusiast than, than maybe the, the pet keeper who just wants a, a, a snake called Kellogg or something in their house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think we, as, if we did a little better at not necessarily calling, but not perpetuating the ones that we know have some issues, it would yeah. be a lot more stable. So I, that's, that's great. Is there anything that we've left unsaid that you, that you wanted to mention before we wrap up or did we hit everything? I don't think so. I mean, I, it was just a bit of a chat, really, wasn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I hope people in, enjoy it, and I hope people gain something from it. Um, no, I think um, exotic pets need exotic vets, and I think go and see your vet. Register your animals with a vet and provide them with good veterinary care. That, that will be my main message that I would like to get across from this. And consider animal welfare. You know, don't just consider what you can breed consider when you're keeping how you can make the conditions as best as you possibly can for the animals. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And, and as far as where you can be, now I'll say this with a caveat before I ask this question. <laughs> Obviously, Tarek is a vet. We don't want to be abusing him, him uh, by sending him messages, but I know, so, so don't send him vet messages. <laughs> you can... I can't, I, I, so I legally cannot provide you with advice about animals which are not formally under my care, which I haven't examined. So don't send me emails are, are, are trying to get a, a free vet consult because I probably won't respond. Um, but I have, I am on social media. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and I post pictures of my own snakes. And I sometimes post, I share posts from my works Facebook page. Um, so if you're interested in following an exotic vet and an exotic keeper, follow me on Facebook or Instagram. I, I have a very unique name. I will be the only one that comes up if you type that in. Um, yeah, by all means. Awesome. And I'll make sure that's in the show notes for people to go find. So thank you so much. This was, uh, I loved this chat. I, I think we'll definitely have to do another one in the future because I'm sure yeah. there's more we can chat about. So thank you so much. This was absolutely great. No problem. Thank you for having me on and well done as well. I think this is such a fantastic podcast. I love how you're getting people from all over the world as well to engage in this um, discussion about animal welfare and reptile welfare. I think that's fantastic. Well done. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm having a blast with it. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Okay, that brings us to the end of episode number 79. Tarek, thank you so much for joining me on an episode. I did really enjoy that. And like I said, off air afterwards, I think it would be awesome to have you on again in the future. Maybe we can get you involved in one of the round table discussions because I know you have a lot more information to share. And to the listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. As always, I know you would have enjoyed that episode. If you are looking for any more information on Dr. Abu Zar, make sure you head to the show notes there. I have links to both his social media on 
Facebook and Instagram. And again, please don't message him with veterinary questions. But if you are interested in following a vet, he does post some really interesting things on his Facebook. There's always you know updates from his clinic and his Instagram has pictures of his collection and whatnot. So if you are interested in that, make sure you go give him a follow. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for a new enclosure or any new reptile equipment, make sure you head to the show notes and click on the affiliate link also in the YouTube description. And if you do make a purchase, a small commission will come back to me at no extra cost to you. All right, everyone. Thank you very much as always for listening and I'll catch you guys in the next episode.